Scripture says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Again, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 28, Romans chapter 21 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul, after having spoken about the power of the gospel, he says in verses 30, uh, 28 through verse 31, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. This evening, I'd like for us to discuss the family. This whole month, the elders have seen fit to dedicate our lessons, both Benjamin and mine, lessons on the family. Proverbs is a book that is full by the pen of Solomon and David and the sons of Korah and others, of advice on children, advice to children, advice to parents, advice to children on how they ought to behave and things that they ought to do while they're young, middle age, and in their older years, and advice to parents, and advice from parents to children. Then in Ephesians and Colossians, two prison epistles, Paul makes mention, giving direction to instructions to parents and to children. We are living during a time when the statement, as our brother Moyer once wrote, says, as goes a home, so goes society. And the family is a backbone of a strong nation. Where the family is weak, we can be sure that immorality is strong. And sin is a reproach to any people. And Proverbs 14.34 is a reference that our brother Moyer made when he wrote that. Therefore, the nation that loses its bearings when it comes to the family will not stand long. And that's why I, I reference you to Romans chapter 1 and beginning there in verse 28. But notice now in verse 29, after he, he talks about this depravity, this giving them up to a depraved mind to do the things that are not proper, it's because of a nation or a, a people, a society, that decided to, to ignore the words of God, that decided to ignore that God even existed and replace God with their own imaginations and their own machinations or their own devices. So he says in verse 29, people having been filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness, greed and evil, full of envy and murder, strife and deceit, they are gossips. Not only are they these things, but notice they're slanderers and they become haters of God. And if a people become haters of God, that they don't respect God to the point that they hate God, Paul continues to add to this list that the people are also insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, and disobedient to parents. And he finishes off this list with saying, by saying that they're without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. Hence the quote, or the importance, in my idea, of the quote, as goes the home, so goes society. And I would say, and the church. The home is the heartbeat. 
The home is the core, it should be, of for teaching, of for bringing up, of for discipline should begin. It should always be the responsibility, as we'll read in scriptures here shortly, it should always be the responsibility of the family, of the parents, to teach respect, to, to, to teach honor, and to bring up the children in what would be considered the right way. Standard of morals, a set of ideals, a set of, of rightness, not the responsibility of the state, of the church. This is one of the reasons why I oppose so vehemently when denominations come up with this idea of having kids' church where they, adults come to the church assembly and they sit and they listen to sermons while the children are separate from the parents having their own church. That's not a way for a family to learn about God. It's not a way for a family to be brought up together listening the Word of God or listening to the Word of God and being brought up together as a family listening to God's Word. It would be, in my estimation, unthinkable. It would be unimaginable that God would make people and then put us here on this earth without giving us some type of an owner's manual or some type of a book, a guide, a reference that would teach us on how to behave as people and then on how to raise our children. If you think about it, when you go and buy a refrigerator, not only does it have this yellow sticker on it that tells you how much energy you're going to save every year, but when you open it up, it has an owner's manual on how to plug in a refrigerator and how it works, in case you just didn't know how a refrigerator works. But it has a 30, 40 page owner's manual in English, Spanish, Chinese, and maybe other languages on how to operate the refrigerator. You buy a waffle iron and it comes with an owner's manual. Every piece of equipment that you've ever bought has an owner's manual. My goodness, when you buy your first brand new car, I'm not talking about a used car. But the first brand new car you buy, especially if you're a man, you're probably going to spend hours reading that owner's manual. You may, As a male, you may, may never ever read another owner's manual for anything, but for a vehicle, you'll read an owner's manual from cover to cover. And for children, God has given us, for children, the most complex, the most confusing, especially when they get to those nasty teenage years. Creations that God has given us. Surely He hasn't left it up to our own imaginations on how to bring them up. He's given us an owner's manual. And I assure you, we can't redo this. We can't do it again. Once our children are raised and gone, we can't go back and do it over. We have one shot. And I think that when we are dedicated to God and have dug our nose in the scriptures as parents, we have a better shot in raising our children right when we're doing it God's way than anybody other's way. So for that, let's concentrate on four verses. They're in Ephesians chapter 6. You know my style of teaching is not to jump all over the Bible. But let's stay where Paul wants us to stay in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. And we'll make some other references, but let's read verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. A parallel passage is Colossians 3 and, and in verse 20. But for now, Ephesians 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents for this is right. Or obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. 
I'd like for you to understand that, that when Paul sent this letter to the church at Ephesus, he was expecting everyone at church, everyone in the assembly, everyone that made up that church, to read the letter, to listen to its contents as it was being read, including children. Now, we might have in our minds a picture when he says children here that he's referring to maybe a two or three year old. But you can't really, truly believe that that's who he's talking about. A two or three year old as he's writing this letter, chapter six, verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. He is addressing children that have the mental faculties, the mental capabilities to be able to understand at the very minimum, what this one passage is teaching. He is expecting that those in the audience, which are children of an age that can understand what's being said, to listen to his words, to at least listen, if not read, the letter written by the inspired apostle from the Holy Spirit. Now, I understand that these children who are also part of the Ephesian church, they might not be old enough to understand the manifold wisdom of God, to understand the entirety of the Ephesian letter. But here's the rub. Most of us adults can't understand the entire Ephesian letter either the first time around, can we? We have to read it and reread it. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we spent an entire quarter studying Ephesians, didn't we? Psalm 122 and verse 1. Psalm 122 and verse 1. I, I, I believe that one of the major responsibilities that, that we have as parents is to make sure that we bring our children to the assembly of the Lord's people. When we come to church, to use a modern day term, when we come to worship, our children should come with us. I, I remember preaching a, 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 for several weeks in Colombia and speaking to a young couple. Later finding out that they had children, I asked them, where are your children? And this young couple are, are Christians. They said, well, we don't bring our children because they fuss. We'll wait until they're older, like teenage years, before we start bringing them to church. And I said, they'll never come. They will never come when they turn 12, 13, or 14 years old unless it's, there's something in it for them at that age, unless there's a hook, unless there's a carnival, there's candy, there's food, unless there's something in it for them. But if you wait until that age, you've lost the battle. And here the psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord. I wonder how many times we've read this passage and ever thought that it applies to children as well. This is a passage that applies, should apply, we should apply it to everyone in our household, shouldn't we? It should be a family function. Just as we get excited to go to the water park, just as we get excited to go to Disney World, just as we get excited to go to the baseball game or any other activity, I was glad my family and I made it something that was a, a, an event, a, something great for us to go to the house of the Lord. But it's up to me as a parent, isn't it? To be able to instill in my children that excitement and that enthusiasm. But if they see me kicking around on Sunday mornings and dragging my feet and complaining and with a long face, does that not teach them the same attitude? But if I'm excited, if I'm doing my lessons, if I'm, if I'm studying on a daily basis, as the scripture says, morning and evening, let the law of the Lord not depart from your eyes and teach it to your children when they wake up and when they go to bed. If they see that within, between mom and dad and I'm teaching them those things, should they not? Would they not be excited as well? You know they will be. This passage applies to the entire family unit. I was glad. I was excited. I was happy when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. The Jewish tradition held 
that a boy, by the time he reached 12 years old, was already a legal, free, and independent man. He was an adult by 12 years old. You've heard of the bar mitzvah, haven't you? Now, in modern day culture, a Jewish boy goes to his bar mitzvah, he still goes back home with his parents. But, but in the Jewish tradition, at 12, he was free to marry. He was free to sign contracts. He was free to make adult decisions. Now, the idea is that children of any age, whether you are 12 or you are 60, are to be obedient to their parents in the Lord. There's that proviso, in the Lord. You know, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 42, we read where Jesus was 12 years old. Jewish tradition, legally, a man. And when you read verse 51 and connect to verse 42, guess what it says about his subjection to his parents? He was in subjection to his parents at age 12. This teaches us that we should be in subjection, in obedience to our parents as long as what they are asking of us or commanding of us is within the confines of God's word. In other words, if they ask us to smuggle moonshine for them or do something ignorant, for, we, we shouldn't do those things at any age. But then notice the word obey. It's not a suggestion here. It's not, is it convenient for you? Again, children of any age. It's not if you feel like it, but it's a commandment. Both Roman law and Jewish scripture agreed on the duty of children to obey their parents. Josephus, a historian of that time, understood the Old Testament to teach that honor, honor to parents speaks, or ranks rather, second only to honor God. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is that to God, and the fifth commandment is that to parents. And if you separate those and put them side by side in columns, the first and the fifth go side by side. So the Jews understood, whether they did it or not, they understood that being obedient to their parents and honoring their parents was second only to honoring God. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, notice how the word obedience is used here to God, but the same word obey that Paul uses in Ephesians 6 and verse, in verse 1, Paul says in Philippians 2, 12, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We should always be willing to obey our parents. Remember in Matthew 21 and verses 28 to 31, the parable of the two sons. Dad says to one, I want you to go out into the field and do some work. How old was that child? How old was that son that dad says, go out to the field or go out to the vineyard and work? He wasn't a five-year-old child, was he? He was old enough to do labor in the vineyard. And the boy says, yes, sir, right on it. And he didn't do it. Second one is told, go out and work in the vineyard. He says, I ain't going to do it. But then thinking about it, he goes and does it. Jesus asked the Pharisees, which of these two did what was right? Which one of these two was righteous? The first one that said and didn't do it, or the second one that said no, but eventually obeyed his father? And the obvious answer is the second one. That's the shortest parable of the Bible, by the way, the shortest parable of Jesus, by the way. And that's the idea of obedience. Doing what is right. Therefore, obedience and righteousness is hand in glove. And then there's that proviso in verse 1 of, of, of Ephesians 6. In the Lord. Sometimes parents will make unholy demands on children. And children are not obligated to obey their parents in these situations. That's what that means in the Lord. We should always respect our parents. 
but we don't always have to obey them when their demands are unholy. Why? Because ultimately, when you think about this passage and others, it has to do with the a child and parent relationship and obedience and honor and respect. God is asking us, ultimately, that we obey God. And when we obey our parents, we're ultimately obeying God. And that's why we are to first obey God, and then second, we obey whomever else comes in that order or in that rank. In Colossians 3 and verse 20, we read, For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. We are first to please God. And then in this case, our earthly parents. Proverbs 1 and verse 8. Proverbs 1 and verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. The first reason for obeying our parents is, one, because it pleases the Lord. The second reason, and it could be your reason, as valid as mine, but I'll offer you my second reason, is that the child is to know the Lord so intimately to the degree as a child goes to bed, he hears and reads the word. As he wakes up, he hears and reads the word. He is to know the Lord so intimately that obeying the parents comes automatic, as automatic as obeying God in the Lord. And isn't it such a terrible thing when a seven or eight-year-old child disrespects his parents? Don't you feel shame? When you see that, don't you feel embarrassment and shame when you see a teenager balling up a fist and threatening to punch his mother or his father out? But you know what's sadder than that? A 50-year-old man disrespecting his father and his mother. That's why we have the scripture here. As Christians, we should never do that. As Christians, this is highly offensible to God. It's or rather highly offensive to God. Proverbs 6, 20, my son, observe the commandment of your father. Proverbs 6 and 20, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. These two Proverbs, 1, verse 8, and 6 and verse 20, notice it begins with the father and it ends with the mother. Do you know why both of them are mentioned? Because it is both mom and dad's responsibility to raise the children. Don't forsake your father's discipline. Don't forsake your mother's teaching. Observe your father's commandments. Don't forsake the teaching of your, of your mother. In Proverbs 23 and verse 22, listen to the father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Now let's look at Ephesians 6 and verse 2. Because there's another part. Would you advance that slide for me, brother? Honor your father and mother. Which is the first commandment with the promise. Next slide. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may turn out well for you and that you may live a long life on earth. And two slides over, please. So notice what verses two and three are teaching here. By the way, this comes all the way from Exodus 20 and verse 12. From 20 and verse 12. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment. What does the word honor mean? It is higher than obedience because we can teach a dog how to obey, can't we? So it's more than just obeying. It's more than, than just doing what we ask them to do. It's more to that. It's a divine appointment. Or this divine appointment is due to those above us. 
those that are over us. It is our responsibility to revere, to treat as valuable and precious, to show respect and reverence, kindness and courtesy. You've heard it. There's a lot of wisdom underneath all that white hair. There's a lot of wisdom in your parents. So we are to treat them with honor, with this respect, with reverence. Treat them as valuable and precious. You will never have another mother and father. That's just the way it is. And some of you sitting right here don't have a mother or a father alive anymore. And don't you wish you could go back and just one last time have a meal with them and talk. So you can go back and tell, or you can sit down and talk to us about, about how this affects you and give us advice. And all that should make sense to us. But oftentimes it doesn't. And then Paul says, this is the first commandment with a promise. And you know what? It's the only commandment with a promise. There's no other commandment that has a promise like this. Now, why does this co commandment have a promise and join it to it? The promise appeals to us. Remember what I said about, about those children that this uh, Christian couple said I, they weren't going to bring them to church until they were 13. I said the only way they'll come at that age if there's a hook a selfish hook to bring them. Well, this promise appeals to our selfishness. If you honor your parents, if you honor your mother and father, here's your selfish hook. You'll have a long life. There's the promise. But now, what does this promise mean? Does this mean that every person that honors or who honors their parents are automatically guaranteed a long life. I know many of folks who are very respectful and loving and honoring of their parents that died at a, at a young age. So what happened? Did God lie? What is this passage teaching? The promise is not for each individual in the sense that, that, that we're all going to live physically a long life. But here, here's the idea of this long life. Where obedience to parents is found, where honor to parents is found, there is usually found along with it temperance, self-control, industry, regular ways of life, and other habits that tend towards prosperity and longevity. In other words, we are promised to live a better lifestyle, a more productive, less troubles in this world. If you would have but listened to your parents' advice, you could have avoided a lot of heartache, couldn't you have? That's the point. Honor the hoary head. Honor the gray hairs. Listen to them. Listen to them. I know for a fact Benjamin and I have both gotten these talks from Roger where he says, I'm not speaking to you as an elder, I'm speaking to you as a father. And sometimes we look at him and wonder what's going to come out. But there's a lot of wisdom there. We just have to humble ourselves and listen. In Christian families, there's commonly affection and unity and prayer and mutual helpfulness, reliance on God, trust in Christ. That's what's found in Christian families. Functional. That makes life sweet and wholesome. The spirit of the promise of a long life is realized in such ways and and it may be likewise in special mercies that is, that is shown to each family that we can enjoy a peaceful life on earth if we learn to honor our parents. Now, what, what are some ways that we can honor our parents? I would say 
Mark chapter 7, verses 11 through 13 is a great example. Maybe in a way not to honor our parents, but in caring for them when they're elderly. We are a society that tends to put away and do away and push aside the things and the people that are no longer useful to us. And, and we shouldn't do that, especially with our parents. So one way that we can honor our parents is by caring for them in the years of their declining health and mental acuity, when they can't take care of themselves properly anymore. And it is frustrating and it is, it is at times painful to hear the things that they have to say to us. But you see, in Mark chapter 7, verses 11 through 13, Jesus is addressing a group of people that had the financial means to take care of their parents. But they decided or found a loophole to not take care of their parents by saying, all of my money, all of my, all of my possessions that I could use to help mom and dad, I have promised it to God. I have vowed it to God. And when you make a vow to God, I mean, you got to burn your daughter on the altar, don't you? When you vow things to God, you can't break a vow, which is not true. A good study through Leviticus will teach us that if that's not true. First of all, you don't make those type of vows. Second of all, you should always honor your, your parents, your father and mother. So that was their way of saying, Mom and Dad, I would gladly help you and take care of you, pay for your food, uh, take you in or buy you a house that you could live in, provide for a nanny, provide for a nurse, but I just can't afford it because I gave God all my money. That don't make sense, does it? In 1 Timothy chapter, four, or chapter 5 and verse 4, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents. And there are some folks that would help a stranger that they've never met before they help their parents. Verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, that is his own family, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And if we do not take care of our own family, our own parents, when they have a need, how do you think it's going to fare for us when we meet God face to face? Proverbs twenty twenty, we should never mock our parents, make fun of them. Call them stupid, ignorant, fuddy-duddy, old, or whatever imaginative name we can come up with. We should never call them names to their face or behind their backs. Proverbs 20, 20, He who curses his father, his mother, his lamp will go out in time of darkness. It's been my experience. That when everyone, or when I, when I have been all by myself, this is pre-marriage, obviously. And that I have been bad and misbehaved and got in all kinds of terrible trouble. That the only one that vouchsafes for me, the only one that shows up to help. Not even my father, but my mother. Mamas will do the impossible for their children. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it's amazing what mamas will do for their children. So he who curses his father, his mother, his lamp will go out in time of darkness. And then the 30th chapter of Proverbs, verse 17, the eye that mocks a father and scorns his mother well, the ravens of the valley will pluck out his eyes and the young eagles will eat it. And of course, all these are, are things that are, are curses that are pronounced upon those who defy their parents or deny them honor and obedience. 
But if you would, please go to chapter 6 of Ephesians, verse 4 now, as we bring this lesson to a close. And very briefly address the parents, because Paul very briefly addressed the parents in one verse. He begins by saying, Fathers, and do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I will say to you that the Greek word father here, pater, literally means the male adopted or biological father. It is male. So a first cold reading, you would leave here thinking that he's only addressing dads. But that's why I gave so many passages in Proverbs where the Proverbs is both mom and dad. And the context here from verses 1, 2, and 3 imply that Paul has in mind mom and dad, parents. This is why other versions, English versions, do not use the word fathers, but use the word parents. I believe fathers here is inclusive of mothers to whom the practical administration of the household the training, the raising, and the rearing up of children is also a responsibility of, along with the father. If children are left to themselves, they will rebel, they'll tear the house up, and they'll tear themselves up. It is necessary for the parents to train their children. The Duke of Windsor years ago said, after coming and taking a tour through America, he said, everything in the American home is controlled by switches, except the American children. And the Bible records the sad results of parents neglecting their children, either by being bad examples to them or failing to discipline their children. So when he says here, do not provoke them or do not exasperate, to anger. Notice that he doesn't say fathers love your children. I wonder why he didn't say do not love your children. I mean, fathers love your children. But yet he goes the other direction. He says do not provoke your children. I, I think it's because it's understood that they're to love their children. But let's look at the word provoke here, or exasperate. Other translations has it as exasperate. It means to anger alongside or to provoke them to wrath. In other words, modern day word is don't be a bully to your children. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. The word implies being so heavy handed and unreasonable with children that they are driven to the helpless state and frustration and anger. Colossians 3.21 says, Do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart, so they won't give up. Some parents abuse the authority by not disciplining, which would be the other extreme. They're constantly seeking the approval. or so, Yeah, some parents don't discipline, and they're always wanting the approval of their children. They're pushovers. They want to be their friends, and they avoid any type of discipline so that they might be able to please their children instead of correcting them. We have some Bible examples. Benjamin mentioned, I believe, Eli uh, last week in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 13, where he failed to correct his children who were stealing the meat from the sacrificial pot and taking out the ladies behind the temple and having sex with them. David pampered Absalom and, and, and failed to correct him when he murdered in front of a lot of people and it was so obvious. Set a bad example by not correcting him. And later on, one of David's soldiers found Absalom hanging from a tree by his hair and then gutted him there. Isaac pampered Esau and Rebekah pampered Jacob and Jacob pampered his youngest son. It was just a total mess. When parents fail to correct their children, to discipline their children, that is a form of abuse. 
you're setting your child up for failure as an adult. And no one likes a spoiled child. Not even the parents. In Proverbs 13, 24, he who, withhold, he who withholds the rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And there are children that have been through a lot. But that does not excuse a lack of discipline. Having studied child psychology, I will tell you this. Children are a lot smarter and wiser than some of us parents are. And they will learn how to play you. I know the one I have sitting up front that had her tonsils out, she learned very quickly how much she could push mama. They'll pull on our heartstrings. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son in his early years while there is hope. Because once they grow up, there is no hope. You can't straighten the tree once it's mature and crooked. In 1 Samuel 3 and verse 13, speaking about Eli and his sons, I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. And this man ended up dying of a heart attack, it seems like. But this does not mean that parents are to physically, emotionally abuse their children either. Because that's another extreme. Where parents beat their children senseless. Abuse has never been condoned, not even in the old days. And I know some of you were beaten. I can tell. I was hit with sticks and rods and bicycle rubber tubes. But that don't make it right. Parents, we will be judged on how we treat our children. Belittling our children is condemned as well. I brought you into this world and I'll take you out of this world. It's, you'll be better off pouring hot wax down a tiger's ear in a phone booth than messing with me, boy. <laughs> Jerry Clower, right? <laughs> those things are funny. But when we say those things out of anger or discipline out of anger, those things aren't right. We have become bullies. Discipline, correction, whether it be corporal or verbal, must be done with love, with the desire to correct. Never out of anger, revenge, or just because I can. We need as parents to remember that when we discipline, we discipline in the way that we want God to discipline us. Fairly and righteously. So what are some ways that parents can exasperate their children? By living an inconsistent life. Do as I say, but not do as I do. By parents drinking alcohol and telling their children this is wrong, don't you do it. By taking drugs and telling our children, don't do it. How can you, with a straight face, say that to your children? Don't. Don't go out and party at night and get drunk with your friends while you have a Schlitz in the refrigerator. That might be a, a territory thing, but I don't know if they sell Schlitz out here or not. Watching sexual scenes on television or movies and telling the kids, get out of the room because I'm about to watch something that you shouldn't be watching. Does that make sense? Reading immoral stories on our phones or watching some of these half-naked girls on TikTok or boys now and telling our kids, I'm monitoring what you watch on social media. Looking at magazines, exposing the human body, eating too much, wasting time dressing or exposing the body to attract attention, but then trying to teach our little girls how to be modest. Attending socials or parties or concerts that are loose on decency, morality, and marital faithfulness. 
and on and on and on. Singing Red Solo Cup as, a, as if it was the national anthem in the family vehicle. And then when the child asks, what does that mean? In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 52, how do you think a child would turn out? That child's grandparents were Ahab and Jezebel, and his daddy was Jehoram. In 1 Kings twenty two fifty two, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. That dude was bad. But he had grandma and grandpa as great examples. Ahab and Jezebel. Second Chronicles 22 and verse 3, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. There you have grandma telling him to do wicked things. Another way that we can exasperate our children is by being overbearing, nitpicking, over controlling. The last part of verse 4. Of Ephesians 6 says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents, we are to nurture our children in a supportive matter, manner. Just like we nurture our bodies, that's what the word nurture means there, just like we feed our bodies. Ephesians 5.19 says, for no one ever hated his body, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Just like we support our children to do well on math tests, on reading tests, on football or any sport, just like we push them to be the best and to excel in those other things, we're told here as parents, mom and dad, your job is not only to take care of them and to raise them, to discipline them, but notice, to discipline them and to instruct them in the Lord. That's our duty. That's our job. A child who is brought up in Christ grows up learning to love and to know what love is. A child that is brought up or brought to Christ grows up learning power and triumph, knows that that no matter what happens in life, no matter how terrible society gets, there is hope of everlasting life. A child that is brought to Christ and is given the good, great, awesome example of parents who are Christians will desire to one day serve the Lord and serve the Lord's church. This is a responsibility that we have as parents, the responsibility that you have as children, the responsibility that we all have as children. This is the family as God would have it. Parents, we have this awesome responsibility of training up a child in the way that he should go. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Children, we have also an awesome responsibility of honoring father and mother at every stage of their lives and our lives, as long as we have parents. And together, we have the utmost and the most awesome responsibility of honoring our Heavenly Father. And that's what the family is supposed to do while on this earth. In John 5 and verse 19 through 20, Jesus is our perfect example of how a son should treat and honor his father when he said, I come here not to do my will, but to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus could have done whatever he wanted to. He could have obeyed, disobeyed. He could have honored or dishonored. But he left us a perfect example. And that was obedience up to dying on the cross. So he could sit at the right hand of God. And gives us the same hope. And that hope is that if we obey the gospel, 
We submit ourselves to the will of God, our Father, to obey the gospel, confessing that Jesus is our Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. We, too, can one day be in heaven. Make your decisions to get we stand and sing.